you thank you for the introduction the moment this mic was kept on my head the first question i asked is it on they said they will control it but still i didn't have the confidence to sing well uh, this also reminds me of the responsibility of uh, what we speak from here it's not that uh, i am inspired by the holy spirit but when i speak from the word it's a great responsibility so it came as a reminder to me while i was wearing this headphone today i am going to speak from ephesians chapter 4 and those who expected a topical sermon think i have to disappoint you number one i it was not told to me that it is going to be a topical study that's okay but there will be a topic in the passage that we are going to read we are reading from ephesians chapter 4 and i'll read the first 16 verses those who have studied ephesians those who have tried to read ephesians uh, may face this challenge as we read the first couple of chapters it's quite difficult to understand i don't know about you but i found it difficult to understand one of the basic problems with ephesians is that they have long sentences yeah i hate long sentences It was told that I work in a radio station, and the first thing that they gave us in training is that please don't use long sentences. Use short sentences. It's easy for people to understand. So Ephesians was not my favorite book. I always had a problem. Oh come on, long sentences, very complicated ideas, difficult to understand. But you can't do that forever. You have to somehow. read this book also and to understand what it says so i think some 2 years ago i had an assignment to go through this book and that's how i started reading this book over and over again and this book uh, very simply can be divided into two parts the theory and the practical which is very common in paul's writings the first three chapters big theory Uh, what do you have in christ the riches that you have in christ your position in christ and then of course he talks about the church the mystery of church which was hidden for a long time people we take church for granted right we take it for granted but do you know that david or even solomon the wise people like solomon they had no idea what is this no idea and it was revealed to us and the greatest mystery uh, for a jew like paul is that gentiles like us can be part of god's very plan that also they will understand because many jewish uh, many john non jewish people were proselytes they followed the jewish law and they became christians but you know what is the surprising thing for paul and other Jewish people in the first century it's that the gentiles can continue to be a gentile they still can eat ham and be part of the church unthinkable that's the mystery paul talked about that and then in chapter 4 onwards he is talking about the practical application right we are going to read that i therefore a prisoner for the lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness with patience bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace there is one body and one spirit just as you were called the one hope that belongs to your call one lord one faith one baptism one god and father of all who is over all and through all and in all 
But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed and fro, to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself, itself up in love. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and I pray that God will speak to us as we go through this passage. Paul is addressing himself as a prisoner for the Lord and he urges you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Now the word church, which is mentioned in the previous chapters, that word is... Uh, the root word is someone who's been called out. That's the word. So when you come to chapter 4, by the way, there are no chapter division in the original letter. It was just a letter. Okay, Chapters and verses have been added. So it could be a play of words. Those who are called out, they are the church. And now he's talking about walking in a manner worthy of the calling. So you are called... And it is your responsibility to demonstrate your call by the way you walk. Now, what is walking? Some of us go for a walk, right? Some of you have daily target, how many steps you will take, you know, the walking target. Mine is only 6,000. Some of you have 10,000, right? Now, what is walking? Walking doesn't have anything exciting. You've seen the walking competition in Olympics and Asian Games? Somebody is watching them always. They are looking if there is a point in time where both the foot is above the ground. Then you are disqualified. That's not walking, that's running. Walking is a very normal thing and there is nothing exciting in it. Taking one step at a time in the right direction. That's all. Is there anything exciting about it? It's nothing exciting about it. And that's why New Testament calls are life. A walk. It's our normal life. There's nothing exciting every day. No, it's our normal life. And that, that is our walk. Now we need to take care of our daily walk or our daily life. It should be according to to the calling. Now, how we should walk, he explains with all humility. We all know, or we all like humility, especially if it is in other people, right? If you see a humble person, you like it. We all like humble people. But to have humility of our own, oh, that's difficult. In Philippians, in Philippians chapter 2, when we have that classic passage where we read of the, the dissension of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's actually talking about his humility, the way he gave up his right. And there Paul said, it is considering others better than yourself. Wow. 
Is that possible? You know, uh, when we started homeschooling, our children, some of them were in school, so we pulled them out from the school. And this is one question we were asked by many people. You know what? They were asking us, how do you know or how do you prove that your children are better than other children? You know, that's our basic craving. We want to prove to others that we are better than others. I had a very simple answer. If I said, I am not better than others, then how can I expect my children to be better than others' children? So that was the end of that argument. But we have this problem. We want to prove that we are better than others. But humility is to consider others better than ourselves. To consider their plans are better than mine. Consider their suggestion better than mine. That's hard, isn't it? But that's what the Bible asks us, to be humble. And gentleness or meekness. Now these are the qualities which we are are not and we are not encouraging to have in our even in our children. I need not explain this. You know, it was not there at that time also. The Stoic philosophers they never considered meekness or humility as a good virtue. They wanted to conquer others, they wanted to show others that they are better than others. But to be meek is a godly virtue. To be gentle. Now, it is very easy to be gentle to your boss. Right? You go to your office, if, when you are reporting to your uh, superiors, oh, you are very humble and meek. But the Bible says your meekness should be known to all men. That includes your colleague. That also includes those who work under you. That also includes your children. Will your children say that my dad is gentle and meek? Wow, that's quite challenging. Right? That's what the Bible says. Meek and humble. By the way, the moment you realize that you are humble and meek, you lost it, right? That's what we normally say. But you know what? In the Bible, there are two people who actually said about themselves. Mm, not said exactly. Number one, first person is Moses. In the book of Numbers, he wrote it. What is that? The meekest man on the earth, right? He wrote about himself. But Moses, the case is that God said that, so he had to write it. He was reporting it. But when you come to New Testament, Jesus said that about himself. I don't think we can claim that, but this is what is required of us. Then we read of a long suffering of patience, bearing with one another in love. You know what is long suffering or patience? If everyone behaves the way you like them to behave, there is no need of patience. Let me put it this way. None of you in CBF will get on my nerve. You, can't, you will not irritate me. You know why? Because I don't come to your church. <laughs> when people do things that I don't like, ah, that's when we need patience. And you know, some people, they, they don't like certain things and they try to prove that what they don't like is sin. Okay? Only God can say that. God can say that what I don't like you doing, that's sin. We can't say that. If you don't like it, that's okay with you. Does the Bible say, the word of God say that that's wrong? No, no, no. The Bible doesn't say, but I don't like. And then you start searching for verses to prove that. Your dislike is a sin. Don't do that. 
Only God can do that. When others do things that you don't like, how do you behave? How do you react? That's where you need patience, which means, which actually means to have a very long fuse. Don't blow your fuse very quickly. That's quite difficult, right? But Paul is saying that you need to have these qualities. Then you come to chapter, verse 3. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, he's actually talking about unity in the church. But to have unity, the first thing that you need to have is humility. The same argument is there in Philippians as well. He deals with humility, then he talks about unity. If you don't have humility, forget about unity. If you have humility, you will consider others better than yourself. That is an ingredient, important ingredient for unity. Now, if you consider your brother better than yourselves, if you consider you, your brother's idea is better than your idea, will there be an argument? There will not be. It's, it's, it's all about humility. If you are humble, you will be able to maintain the unity. Now, in verse 3, it talks about being eager to maintain the unity. One translation says, do everything possible to maintain unity. That means unity is there. Unity is there, that's why we belong to the church. That's why we are Christians. We belong to the body of Christ. And then he explains the reason for our unity which we actually inherited. We didn't do anything to get that unity. We inherited that unity when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why from verse 4 onwards, we read about some seven ones. They are same. They are similar for all of us. What are they? One body. We just remembered that, you know. We belong to one body by taking part from the table. One spirit. It's the same spirit of God worked in us, convicted us of our sins, and the same spirit baptized us into the, into the body. We have one hope. We have one destiny, right? We are looking forward to the second coming, that glorious hope. Then we have one Lord. We have one faith. By faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we all became the children of God. One baptism. Unbelievable, right? People fight. Denominations fight over baptism. But Bible says one baptism and then one God the Father. It's actually talking about the oneness. We have so many things, seven things that are similar for all of us. There is no difference. Oh, that's interesting. It's almost like uniformity, right? We all have the same. But look at verse 7. But grace was given to each one, not to all, each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Till now Paul was talking about same things for all of us. Now he's talking about what is different in us. And that is the gifts that are given to you. The gift of grace, the grace gifts, or the supernatural enablement which the Lord has given to each one of us, and they are different. And I'm sure you would have studied about spiritual gifts. You now, spiritual gifts are not the same for all of us. Okay, Now, they are different. We all have at least one spiritual gift. All born-again believers, whoever you are, you have at least one spiritual gift. The question is, do you know about them? Or do you know about your spiritual gift? The Bible says you shouldn't be unaware of your spiritual gifts. You should know. Have you ever tried to know your spiritual gift? 
Well, I am sure some of you would have done that question and answers, you know. There's a survey, you, you fill that, you try to find out what is your spiritual gift. There's nothing wrong in that, it will help you. But don't think that if you haven't done, you will not find your spiritual. Spiritual gift is not based on a Google form, okay. It's, it helps. But it is given by the Lord as a gift to you. And it is given to you individually. That means each one of you are given spiritual gift. No one has all the spiritual gifts. No, the lists are there. In Corinthians and in Romans we have the list. And uh, there are a lot of arguments, you know, natural gifts are spiritual gift. I don't want to get into all that. Because that's not my interest. Nobody has all the spiritual gifts. And no singular gift is given to all of you. That is also true. New Testament says that you should know. And if you don't know, what is your spiritual gift? Have you ever tried to find out what's your spiritual gift? Actually, nothing wrong in praying so that you will know what is your spiritual gift. Now, young people, many of them, they want to know what is God's will for them, right? What is God's will for me? Actually, they are not asking for God's will. They are actually asking for three things, particularly. What course to study? They want to know God's will, right? And what job to take? And whom to marry, right? When they ask for spiritual gifts, any of these three things they want to find out, right? Bible is not actually asking us to be aware of God's will in your life. No, there is no verse like that. But the Bible actually tells us that you should know what's your spiritual gift. So anyone who wants to know what to study or where to work or whom to marry or where to stay even, before you find an answer for that, I'll recommend that first find out what is your spiritual gift. You know, in Ephesians, we read that God had a hope when he called you. You should know the hope of his calling. If you work in a company, you will recruit a person. For what? The moment you recruit a person, you will give him a job description and also, if needed, you will give a training. A special enablement, that training will be given to that person. For what? So that he will do his responsibility. Now you are being added to the body of Christ with a particular responsibility that has been given to you. Do you know what is that? Will you dare to go to your work without knowing what to do? But we don't mind being part of the body of Christ without knowing what is your responsibility. That's hypocrisy. Right? Double standard. God wants us to know what's your spiritual what's our spiritual gifts and we should exercise them. Now I need not tell you, but you would have heard this before, that the spiritual gifts are given not for your uh, not for your edification or not for your benefit. It's given for the common good, which means I am being given a spiritual gift so that it will benefit the body of Christ, which is the church. Now, when I say that, when we read the book of Ephesians, we should also remember that though this title is there, Ephesians, it is not written particularly to one local church. It's given to a group of churches around Ephesus, in that, uh, you know, in, in that Asia Minor area. 
That's why there is no personal greeting, no individual problems, right? Nothing is mentioned in Ephesians. So it has been believed by the Bible scholars that it is given to a couple of churches. It's not only for an individual church, a group of believers or a group of churches in that area. Which means the spiritual gifts, the use of the spiritual gift, what Paul is talking here, is not only exclusively for the local body, which is very important, we should do that. It's also for the universal body of Christ. How can we contribute to the church at large? It is an important responsibility of a believer. You should know what is the gift that you have and you should exercise them. Now some people don't want to know about their spiritual gift. I understand that. Because there was a time when I was like that. I didn't want to know what is my spiritual gift. Because I didn't want to get involved. I didn't want to get involved. I just wanted to come to church. My attendance is marked. And off I go. I didn't want to get involved. You know, if you get involved in the activities of the church, the needs of the church, you may find out what is your spiritual gift. You may also find out what is not your spiritual gift. Right? You try to do something, then you prove to yourself, no, this I'm not gifted in that. Someone else is. That's a good learning, right? At least you are showing an interest to get involved. I didn't want to get involved in, this, in, in, knowing, or in the church or in the activities because for me, church was something that we need to do on a Sunday. There was a time like that in my life. Sunday is to be part of the church. And other days, oh, those days belong to me. But you know that when you are a part of a body, you are 24 by 7 part of the body. Just imagine your hand is a part of a body only 4 hours in a week. <laughs> or your liver only one day in a week. If your heart decides I work only Five days in a week. How dangerous that is. Right? We all are needed in the body. So we should be available. And we should be able to use our gifts. For the benefit of the church. So it is not uh, something that you can take off. It is your duty. It is your continuous duty. Well. In verse 8 onwards, Paul is actually uh, quoting from Psalm 68. You know, he is ascended and while ascending he has given gifts. Now this is actually a picture of a king who has gone for a battle. And when they go for battle, they conquer a foreign nation and they get a lot of loot. A lot of things from they conquered. You know that, you know, David went for a battle with the Amalekites when they came back. They had a lot of things. And what did David do? David went to the Jews and he was so liberal in giving gifts. Not only to those who came with him, even those who lived in that land, he gave gifts to everyone. They didn't work for it. They didn't earn it. Right? It was David's decision. He gave gifts. So like that, a king is giving away gifts. Now Paul also says that he talks about ascension in, the, in that psalm. But Paul is making an argument there. If he has ascended, that means he has descended. Why did he bring that here? What is, what is the purpose of this argument? I thought about it. But then I realized it's actually talking about humility. Ascension, going up. We all like it. But going down, we don't like it. right? In giving gifts, it, it has happened because he descended. Okay, So when utilizing our gifts, we should remember this. That you should be practicing humility 
in using gifts. Now, what are these gifts for? We know that from what we read. It is the ministry. Now, when we say ministry or minister, it's a big word, right? We have ministers in the government. Even some of the churches, they call their pastors or leaders ministers. And when they say minister, it's not a derogative term. It is an honorable term. Right? But in actual uh, meaning, minister is the one who actually serves others. What is the serving? What is the address of Elisha? The one who poured water to the hands of Elijah. You understand? They didn't have running water and when they wanted to wash hands, somebody pours water so that the other person will wash his hands. Would you like to do that? That should be the attitude when we exercise our spiritual gifts. Humility. You know, it is very tempting for certain gifts. For example, if you have a leadership gift or a speaking gift, it's very tempting to take pride in it and to show off. That's why I think it was Warren Worsby in his book uh, to Romans, uh, be right, he said, uh, spiritual gifts are not weapons to fight with, nor toys to play with. They are tools to build others up. So we are given these tools to build others up in humility. If you are willing to serve others, you can use your gift to build up uh, the, ch the church. Now when you do that, in verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now, there we have some basic gifts. Apostles, uh, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. We don't have the, uh, the full list of evangelists, uh, of uh, spiritual gifts. The reason is, it is not about what are your spiritual gifts, the list. That is not important. How we exercise our spiritual gifts. That's important. That's why Paul is not giving uh, the details of the gifts. Then he says, this is to be used so that we all attain to the unity of faith. You remember? It started with unity of the spirit. Now he's not talking about unity of spirit, unity of faith. Unity of things that we believe. Now when we exercise our spiritual gifts to build people up, we are going to attain something that we didn't have. Number one, unity of faith. You know, that is going to affect our faith. Secondly, of the knowledge of the Son of God. We are going to know about our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course we know about Him. Our Christology is quite good. We know the basic things that we need to know about our Lord Jesus Christ. But here, He's talking about experiential knowledge. That you taste and see. The Lord is good. You experience Him. Right? We all have, we, many of us, we use recipe books. Right? Recipe book will give us the theory, how to do things. But you cannot compare that with a dish. Right? I have a habit of reading when I eat. Reading a recipe book while eating will not help. <laughs> you have to cook. And you have to taste the dish, right? So experiential knowledge is like that. You experience the Lord and, and say that, yes, I know him. Then he talks about maturity. To mature manhood. The opposite is children. You know, verse 14 says, so that we may no longer be children. If you don't exercise your spiritual gift, you will not mature. Not only you, others also won't mature. Because certain gifts are given to you so that you will help others to grow. 
Okay? So if you don't use your spiritual gifts, it's not only you are stagnated, you are hindering the growth of others. The tool is with you. You are not using it. And you will uh, contribute to the immaturity of the body of Christ. People will be like children. What's wrong with the children? Of course, children, they are attention seekers. They need to be, they, they need to have the attention all the time. If they do have a problem with attention, they'll make big, big noise. Do you know grown-ups like that? So there are some grown-ups like that. They're attention seekers. And they are so selfish. They don't care if others get food or not. They want to get it first. They want all the tasty stuff. They don't care about others. They don't wait for anything. They want everything right now. Your father was taking a son on his scooter and an expensive car passed by. So he asked his dad, Dad, why don't we have a car like that? So the father said, no, God didn't give us a car, that's it. So this child, very small child, he closed his eyes and prayed and then he asked his father, Dad, did you get the money to get buy a car? You know why? Can't wait for God's time. Right? That's the sign of immaturity. We have believers like that. They are in faith for many years, but they can't wait for God's time. Why? Immaturity. They haven't grown. Why? It is easy for us to look at them and say that they are not mature, they are childlike. But the question is, what have you done about it? Do you know that you have a responsibility? You have a responsibility of the spiritual growth of others in this assembly? That is the importance of children. It's a very dangerous thing. Don't ask me. My son swallowed a safety pin. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> okay? They put it in their mouth. The same problem here. Whatever new doctrine comes, whether it is right or wrong, they don't care. They just put it in their mouth. Again, mark of immaturity. Why people do that? We are responsible because we didn't use our spiritual gifts so that the members will grow. Right? So if you don't use your spiritual gifts, you are not growing. At the same time, you are also hindering the growth of others. Now this passage ends like this. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You know, there is a self-maintenance mechanism. We know that it is there in our body. right? It, it maintains by itself. Have you ever uh, stopped your heart for maintenance? No. <laughs> it it's maintains by itself. That's the self-maintenance mechanism in our body. The same thing here. If you do your work, if you exercise your spiritual gift, the body, that is, the church, will grow by itself. Isn't it amazing? Now, we normally talk about revival in the church. We, you need to have revival meetings and all that. But you know why revival is not happening? Because it has to start with you. Utilizing your spiritual gift for the edification of the church. Now, you have to take responsibility. You know something? If you got a degree, for example, an MBA, 
if you say that I got an MBA degree, what is the next question? From where? Right? Right? From which institution you got the MBA degree? That's a very important question. We all know that. Now you've been given a special enablement. From where? From where? By God. We are so proud about our degree certificate and where we studied and all that. They trained me. I got a training from such and such place. Oh, we are so proud to say that. But you know that God has given you a special enablement? And where is that special enablement? Where is it? You've seen people framing their certificates and hanging on the wall, right? They're proud of that. But what about your spiritual gift? What is your attitude towards that? Do you think that God has given you this particular gift so that I will help everyone in the church in their spiritual growth? It's very easy to stand back and say that they are like this, they are like this. They are like that because you are like this. You are not doing your part. And if you do your part, you will see revival happening. You will see the church growing, not only in number, but also in quality. Each one of us are asked to do our responsibility in the body of Christ so that the church of God will grow in love. Shall we pray? Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you are the creator of this universe. Just by your words, the entire universe was created and we marvel at that. And you have taken special interest in each one of us that you individually gave us spiritual gifts. And we've neglected them. We were not using it for the edification of the church. We were neglecting it. And we were guilty of not using it to build others up. Lord, we pray that we will know what is our spiritual gift and without any reservation or any hesitation, we will use it so that your body will grow and they will, the body will function and it will build itself up in love. We offer this prayer in the worthy name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.